Hello, welcome to The Learning Playlist, a podcast for the major and general education courses under the tutelage of Mr. Ryan Dave Reina, USJR College Instructor. This project is a supplement to the set courses and as a means to share knowledge to the public at large. To help the podcast grow, kindly follow us at facebook.com slash the learning playlist. And now, on to our show. Hello, history classes. So, ngatong discussion taron will be revolving around the Spanish Empire. So, um, I'm presuming at this point you have already watched the Treaty of Tordesillas provided for us by the Kings and Generals channel. So, the link has been provided to you via the LMS and Great Space platforms. For now, talking about um, the Spanish Empire, we have three objectives in mind. We need to understand how the Spanish monarchy was formed in the first place, then how the Spanish created and ruled their empire, and then know the effects of Spanish expansion in the Philippines. No? So let's begin with how the monarchy was formed. All right, for the Spanish monarchy, we have the origins of the, this kingdom as part of the original Reconquista or the Reconquest of their homeland which is the Iberian Peninsula. So you can check out the map if you have a world map right now or via the internet. You can check out the map of the peninsula called Iberia. That's to the south of France. So during this time, there were four Christian kingdoms, Portugal, Castile, Aragon, and Napare, around the 1300s to the 1400s that have been waging for at least the past um, 700 years on and off, waging a war of conquest or rather reconquest of their homeland from the invading Moors at the time. Now of all these of all these four kingdoms, um, two emerged. Uh, Castile, Aragon, and Navarre became one and later became Spain, while Portugal stood alone as an independent Iberian kingdom that even rivaled the Spanish you no know, once they were formed into such. Um, under this one, under this historic arrangement or this, this so-called power-sharing arrangement in the peninsula, um, what was created was, uh, was Spain. So, so officially, Spain was created as a, as a sort of marriage between Isabella I of Castile and Ferdinand II of Aragon on October 19, 1469. So their United Kingdom became became the Spanish Kingdom and later the Spanish Empire under their successors. So the Reconquista was a very long period of time. Um, this, was, uh, this was defined primarily by the need of the Christian Iberians to push out the, the Muslims, not the, the, those that they labeled as the Moors. Um, although the Moors did hold on to Iberia for more than for more than, for a good part of about a millennia, no? for most of the Middle Ages, and there was a time that they did create uh, a wonderful civilization in that part of the world. Um, eventually, the the Catholic forces of of Isabella and Ferdinand won, and by fourteen ninety two, the same year that Columbus went into his historic expedition to to the New World, no, although he didn't knew it, knew it at that time, um, the last of the Moors have surrendered to the, to the newly formed Spanish Kingdom. And uh, this, became, well, this became the historic or the defining moment at that time in which Spain became dominantly Catholic and the church and state was established as uh, basically two swords under one, well, under one power. No? So, uh, Regnum Sacerdotum as the old dictum would call it right so once the once the spanish homeland was um, reconstituted into the new kingdom of spain there was now the question of expansion outside of iberia the strong spirit of the reconquista especially the strong crusader spirit of the time prevailed and this resulted in many outward expansion in particular, the Moors 
who have been driven out of the fund, who have been driven out of uh, Iberia, was continually hounded by the Spanish even to the point where North Africa became a theater of war for for many Spanish military well, for military expeditions for generations after the conquista of 1492. Uh, as for as for um, the expeditions that were sent out, they were not just headed towards Africa, but there were expeditions that were that were rather experimental at that time. Notable was the Columbus expedition and the Madel Magellan expedition at the turn of the um, 1500s, no, the 16th century. So, in a sense, um, the Spanish were already looking for a way to expand further, not just in, not just within Iberia, but also without or outside of Iberia. And the first conquest, or rather the first spate of conquest that was rather successful for them was the conquest of the Latin Americas, starting out from the Caribbean, in which um, Columbus discovered peoples there, and uh, some of these uh, Mesoamericans that they discovered there were were colonized. Tragically, they were also wiped out by old world diseases brought by Europeans. No, so there were no immunity here. Uh, you can also look into this idea, see the Colomb the Colombian exchange. Um, in this way, we can see that before they came to the Philippines, the the footprint, or rather the how do I say this? the the blueprint for conquest was already laid in the new world and so if you can see the chronological timeline the the thing is the spanish did not come to the philippines rather empty-handed they already came to the philippines uh, by, and by that i mean the second expedition of conquest which is by miguel lopez de legaspi um they came to the philippines with a clear blueprint with a clear um handbook in mind as to how they would go about their business of colonial conquest. No? So this colonial conquest by the Spanish first was tried and tested in the Latin Americas and later on came in waves after waves throughout the rest of the world, but primarily in the Latin Americas and later in the Philippines. Okay? So motivations vary from exploration and expansion, but I would say primarily the motivations were economic. They were looking for valuable resources that in the first expeditions or in the first waves of expansion, such as the expedition of Hernan Cortes uh, in conquering what is now known as the Aztec Empire, um, it yielded much valuable resources in the form of gold and silver. And also the conquest of Pizarro have also shown that um, there were many native peoples in the Americas that possessed material wealth. Okay material wealth that of course the Spanish coveted. For um, for the Latin American conquest, what did they do? They basically established themselves as a new ruling class known as conquistadores. And the conquistadores created administrative regions called vice royalties. Now take note, the thing with the with the creation of the Spanish cities and the Spanish settlements in the in the New World was motivated primarily by the need to extract wealth from these rich um, new new lands that they have conquered. And they created a society that has ethnic and religious divides. And this, fun, this playbook of divide and conquer became the modus operandi of the Spanish throughout much of their colonial holdings in the, in the 500 years or so of the Spanish colonial um, era. And... People were also divided, but on basis or on the on the idea that they, this can prevent them from uprising. Well, considering that the Spanish who conquered these new lands were numerically inferior compared to the people peoples that they have conquered. Okay, so we have here a map of uh, the vice royalties. Many of these vice royalties later on divided into different Latin American countries, as we can see. I would like you also to look into a parallel example of how these vice royalties uh, gradually broke up. If you can search for um, the Latin American um, hero called Simeon Bolivar, known as El Libertador, the, the liberator, you will see how this fragmentation came about. And um, it's also interesting, if you're going to study Latin American history, 
to look at parallels between what happened there and what happened in the Philippines. Take note, the time period of um, the liberator, Simon Bolivar, occurred only for about, um, let's say, 60 or 50 years odd prior to the outbreak of revolution here in the Philippines. So as you can see, um, many of the realities that are also found in the, in the Spanish in the Spanish possessions in Latin America were also a reality here in the Philippines at that time. No? So if you want to understand more about Philippine history, I would suggest looking at parallels uh, from our cousins in Latin America to educate us better about how these social tensions came to be. Okay, um, so why was the Latin America the template for all the succeeding conquests, no? So again, Spain extracted heavily, um, they extracted natural resources from these lands heavily. And this extraction still continues today with the successor states to the European, uh, to the Spanish colonies. And um, we also see how this extraction of natural resources created as a created a sort of network as an extension of the spanish spanish empire and spanish power so colonies are important in the sense that they gain or that they they provide a country with power in a sense that they can now um they can now better position themselves internationally since colonies are not only status symbols but actual resources for for um, expanding their power no? so the more territory the greater capacity to wage war and engage in economic competition uh, trade now the main means of um the, the main means of transportation and of course the main means of uh, wealth extraction by the spanish came from the galleons which are considered as their maritime arteries uh, later on, I will give you a, a very rich resource on this one, and there will be a workshop about the galleons and how did the galleons actually connect the Philippines to the New World. Okay, so there's a cross section of the galleons. Uh, more of these will be explained in the material that is forthcoming for this lecture. Okay, so in the in the one in the whole scheme of things. Uh, in the whole scheme of things in the Spanish Empire, the Philippines was the last colonial possession, well, arguably, to be acquired by the Spanish no? in their waves of conquest, um, the, as defined by the Spanish dictum, con el espada y el compas, mas y mas y mas, with the sword and compass more and more, um, the, the Spanish Empire acquired the Philippines as a sort of an outpost into Asia. Okay? So, the expedition of conquest by Miguel Lopez de Legazpi, which I referred to earlier as the second expedition of conquest by the Spanish, actually solidified the role of the Philippines as a, not only as a frontier settlement, but, but as an outpost for the Spanish. Okay? And as you will see later on in, in looking at the Trans-Pacific Maritime Galleon trade, uh, you will see that um, this outpost facilitated an exchange not only of ideas but also an exchange of massive amounts of goods that uh, whose impacts are still with us today so the philippines was a staging ground for the spanish ships going to china which is their main destination on for that part no so much of the silver harvested from the new world actually ended up in china where in the huge demand for for silver uh Actually, Kwan actually created a booming trade for for um, between the Chinese and the and the Spanish and even some 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 collaborators of the of the Spanish, the Portuguese, for example. So in a in a way, this this booming trade between China, uh, Spain, Mexico, and the Philippines, um, it became Kwan became the backbone for much of the colonial commercial activities in the country at least that's until the 1800s no so so in this way the spanish colon the spanish colony of the philippines was maintained as an outpost okay as for the uh, as for the why of the name the philippines 
Um, I think we have already covered this a lot in the previous years in high school or in elementary, for example. Okay, so we'll have to sk skip on that. So for the Spanish conquest of the Philippines, there are some myths that we need to break for now. Uh, in, in part, we need to break the idea that the uh, Spanish came here with superior weaponries. Yes, they did came with um, superior firepower technology in, in, the, in the sense of uh, they have guns, in particular the arquebus. But um, it doesn't mean that the native peoples of the Philippines did not encounter these weapons before. Take note. Um, even the even the even the the native kingdom of Tondo here in the Philippines was already reputed to have used cannons, and neighboring kingdoms, even the even the um, conquests of Malacca, was also said to have been um, at least in part to have been slowed down by by cannon weaponry from the from uh, made made from the. Uh, technologies used by Asian peoples at that time. So, in a sense, it's not fun. It's not uh, that huge of an advantage in, in a way. Uh, while European arms did eventually have a huge edge over Kwan, over um, Asian weapons at that time, uh, by, by this time, no, by the time of the Spanish conquest, the, the gap was not even that evident. And in fact, some would say that Chinese weaponry at that time was still superior to anything that the Europeans have. So in a way, there is no, there is no, um, or the myth of Europeans weaponry superiority was one is largely, it's largely just that, a myth. There's also the divide and conquer tactics used by the Spanish. Now on this end, this is rather, well, this is rather um, well documented to be true that the use of divide and conquer was was rather much a, a huge part of the playbook of the spanish in the sense that they play off one side um against the other and they gained serious advantages in that they did that to the aztecs they did that to the incas of latin america and they also did that here in the philippines so you can see that um the spanish again did not come they did not come empty-handed in the Philippines, uh, to the Philippines by the time of Legaspi. In fact, they already have a playbook at hand as to how to divide and conquer, how to run an operation uh, that is essentially military in nature. Uh, of course, um, with a veneer of religious zealotry. <clears throat> and later on, to solidify their conquest, religion was used as a pacifier. And um, this is something. Well, this is something well documented in the in the Spanish archives and even in later in Philippine sources. No, that um, much of the well, much of the work of conquest was actually facilitated by the missionaries rather than by by the heavy hand of the Spanish military. Now, take note: Spanish military might, in many of these instances during the conquest, was largely missing because. Uh, Part of the story or part of that equation is the fact that the Spanish were already tied down in numerous wars in Europe, in particular the long Dutch wars of um, of independence no, that was waged against Spain for much of the 1500s onwards to the 1600s, and later it evolved into the into the massive um, so-called uh, Thirty Years War, which saw the well, which saw the Spanish um, Empire being literally bled dry by 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 years of of warfare in mainland europe so in this way we can see that um the force of arms was not enough and rather um military pun military missions have to give way to the to the use of conversions as a means to as a means to pacify their early conquests okay so the religious orders did what the Spanish military could not do, and that is they they solidified the Spanish hold on to power by creating institutions that allow people to live uh, to live side by side you not know, their new colonial masters. Okay, so this was this is how they facilitated their conquest by creating a sort of identity based around 
um, at that time the the religious ideas of the Spanish pun of the Spanish Empire. Aside from the religious aspect, there's also the encomienda, which is the early form of economic management facilitated by um, the Spanish well, the Spanish colonial system. Now, the encomienda is a direct derivative from the from the European um, feudal system. No, so this is basically a land grant, and everything in within that land was um, for use or for the advancement of the encomendero those who manage the the land and usually the encomenderos were were spanish conquistadores and officials who came to one who came to the new world uh, and to um, administer the the vast land holdings of the spanish um, colonial system so they call they con they collected tributes uh, either in agricultural goods or in the form of labor and the encomenderos essentially ensure that um for the first time in the well, in, in Philippine history, that many of the towns were created as their own form of personal fiefdoms, no? So later on, that will have an effect as to how land tenure is uh, is conducted in the Philippines, no? So the encomenderos were the first one, were the first landlords, no? The the kumbinisaya pa the yutaang agalon of the Philippines. So the landlord. The landlord um, system, or the land, the land tenants, uh, sorry, the, the tenant system, and many of those that came after the encomienda still reflects this very first um, redistribution of land in the in the Philippines. So it's not just the encomienda that was redistributed, no, or, or it was not the only scheme of land redistribution. There was also a form of what we would now call today as land conversion schemes, and that is the reduction, which literally means resettlement. And so what was resettled was the old barangays of few communities. They were organized into towns or barrios after the Spanish system that was common throughout their empire. No? So throughout their, their empire, they already have their own system of resettlement, and this brought about a so-called civilization that allowed people to uh, to um, to settle and to be under literally under the church bells to be easily administered and overseen by not only the, the church but also by the Spanish um, officials. Okay, so there's an organization here in the Philippines that also follows much of the organization created by the by the Spanish throughout their empire. So, district capitals, poblacions, barrios, sitios, and even small visitas or small outlying settlements that um, that allowed people to be connected with the daily life of the parish, which is the center of life in the in the one in the Spanish Empire at that time. So, the Spanish Empire was massive in its scale. However, um, one thing to take note is that this massive scale was also its greatest weakness, no? So distance basically um, made the Spanish made managing the Spanish Empire hard. Okay. Then we have the golden era of the Spanish um, of the Spanish Empire, which was during the time of Felipe II, and he was the he was basically the grandson of Isabella and Ferdinand. And so while Philip II of Spain was very well known for his, um, for his uh, let's say, he was very well known for his work ethic. And he was said to have a very, a very um, strict schedule in life, in his daily life. Uh, even, the, even, the, uh, even the astuteness of such a monarch was not one was not uh, let's say it was not enough to keep the spanish empire together so after Felipe II, the spanish empire was showing many of its cracks so distance was one problem also the sheer size of the empire means that there is always shortage in terms of manpower resources and many other aspects so the development of the empire was not um, at an even pace. There are areas that are very much underdeveloped while other areas were overdeveloped and this later on played 
into the dynamic of empire and the dynamic of Latin American countries and other Spanish possessions throughout the world. Okay? Other Europeans also attack Spain, and we shall see that later in the in the discussion on um, the Seven Years' War and how did um, Diego Silang and his revolution figure out in that in that um, time period no, of the 1700s. So call, Spain was vulnerable from attack, not only within but also without. There's also the question of corruption, and this is uh, something that has been touted again and again, and sometimes even used politically, especially by the Americans, to malign um, Spanish rule in the Philippines and in other colonies, not to make themselves to be benevolent, so crafty Americans. So, uh, in a way, the Spanish Empire had many legacies. However, looking back at those legacies, we can perhaps ask ourselves, no, um, was it all worthy? And most importantly, how did the Spanish Empire manage to last so long, despite the many problems that face it? Okay. So I think with that discussion, I hope you would delve more into the Spanish Empire as um, as a very well, no, as a very interesting topic, not only not only for Philippine history but for world history at large. And this also reminds us that the Philippines is not isolated but has always been part of different economic systems and political systems, whether they be empires or mandalas in the, in the previous era of the pre-colonial period. No? And later on, we shall see that the Philippines was also part of two more empires that continue to have um, lasting legacies upon us decades later. And so for that, thank you for your time, everyone. Um, I hope to add more to this content soon, and you shall also add more to this content soon with your different case studies on, multi on numerous cities here in the Philippines. So group works are forthcoming. So thank you, Kayo, and I'll see you next time.